Hi, Curtis here with Stage Time University. I'm sitting with Darren LaCroix, and I have the questions that you sent, and I'm going to read them on behalf of the Chilean Toastmasters. So, Darren, let's go ahead and begin. Darren, can you describe the feeling of winning the World Championship? Well, first I want to say uh, to everybody watching, like, congratulations. Having Toastmasters in Chile is awesome. I think uh, the founders, the people who are getting it started there, are have no idea the impact they're going to have on their whole country. So anything new takes some time to get up and going and like you are going to touch people's lives for decades to come. So congratulations on the work. Uh, to get to the question, the feeling, it, honestly, it was like nothing else I've ever felt. Uh, I was, had low self-esteem growing up. I had never won any contest ever in my life. And I realized how hard I worked. I had been a part-time professional speaker for over seven years. I've been a Toastmaster for seven years. I've been a National Speakers Association member for seven years. And I'd worked really hard, but it wasn't until the summer of 2001 that I committed to mastering public speaking. Uh, in fact, at that time of my career, it was a mentor. His name was Dave Fitzgerald. He said, Darren, stop trying to find that story that's going to launch your career. Stop trying to uh, find that joke that's going to launch your career. Instead, take the stories you have and make them so good, someone will pay to hear them. So if that's the goal to be a professional speaker, we've got to make them that good. Whether you have a message that you just care about or if you want to do it professionally, either way, to master public speaking, there, there's a lot to it. Just because somebody can stand up and talk and not shake in nervousness doesn't mean you're a good communicator. Are people walking away with your message and walking away with your perspective? All of our value comes from that perspective. So a little off on a tangent there, but the feeling... It really took a year or two before I fully accepted that I won. It, it was emotionally uh, challenging. It was uh, my personal belief. I really believe that it was a God thing, that I did a lot of praying along the way, and it, it really helped. Uh, I believe God was in the room, and I just I can't explain. It was euphoria. It was awesome. And and it wasn't really me as much as it was the hard work that I did, the effort that I did, and the direction that I got from Mark Brown and David McElhaney, my two speaker coaches. Mark Brown, who won in 1995. A uh, brilliant man, great coach. So it was, uh, it was definitely a high point in my life. Can you walk us through your preparation process that led to your victory? Uh, great question. In 2001, I was a part-time professional. And... I loved what I did and I, that was my dream. I wanted to be a professional speaker. And at that time I had two really good stories in my keynote speech. And based on my advice from Dave Fitzgerald, I decided that um, at that point in my life I worked for the Bose Speaker Company. I was a telemarketer working in one of those cube farms and it was a great part-time job. But because I wanted to do this professionally, I was working my part-time job. I was working on marketing myself as a speaker. I was speaking anywhere and everywhere I could. I was a member of four Toastmaster clubs. So I would be in comedy clubs at night and Toastmasters during the day because my mentor said, any day that you don't get on stage is a day that you don't grow. So when I was sitting at my desk at Bose Corporation, this newsletter came across my desk about this thing called Toastmasters. I'm like, what's that? I started reading about like, hey, wait a minute, here's a place I could get stage time during the day. Comedy clubs are only open at night. I could fail twice a day. So that was my preparation began with my habits back in 1994. So it took me seven years to prepare. So I don't want to say, hey, I just did this and this and this and I won. It's not like that. I've been preparing for years. But when you come right down to the actual preparation, I joined the speech contest because I, was, I had all those things going on. The one thing I wasn't doing was working on my craft. Was, as Dave had said, uh, trying to take the stories you have and making, make them so good, someone's willing to pay you to hear them. And because of that, I joined the speech contest in 2001. 
I joined the contest to force myself to work on the stories I was already telling. So I took my famous Stitches story, my first time on stage, and I pulled it out of my keynote and I gave it an open and close. And I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, just to be able to improve it, to put it back in my keynote speech in a better format. So Craig Valentine, 1999 world champion of public speaking says it best. He says, if you want a masterpiece, you have to master the pieces. And that's what I did using the speech contest. So honestly, I won no matter what. It wasn't about the trophy. As cool as the trophy is, it's about self growth. The contest was about my growth. And when I joined the contest, I went out and I listened to all the world champions. I became a sponge. And two quotes that stood out in my head that helped me prepare. Uh, David Brooks, the 1990 world champion said, Darren, let no one out prepare you. Wow, he, he didn't say I had to be the best. He said I had to be the most prepared. And Otis Williams Jr., the 1993 world champion, he said, Darren, be so good, the only question is who comes in second. See, speaking is subjective. So it can be a matter of opinion if, if it's close. And a lot of con speech contests, the, the winner is you know, just a tiny bit better because it's so subjective. And what Otis was saying was create such a gap that everyone in the room knows who the winner was. So I could never rest. For those that summer working on my, that ouch speech, my winning speech, uh, I've never worked so hard in my life. But here's the cool part is that even if I didn't get the trophy, I was never the same speaker after that process because I learned to prepare like my friend Mike Rayburn says a virtuoso. I prepared to be the best and not the best speaker, but the best one to serve the audience. The trophy is the side effect to whoever serves the audience the most. So in my preparation process to get back to the question, uh, I used my best two stories. In the old days of the speech contest, there were, you had to have three different speeches. So I had my Stitches story, that was my district winning speech. Uh, my valet story, which was my uh, regional winning speech, now called the semifinals. And by the way, if you're an overzealous Toastmaster, I will say am um and ah on occasion. I don't care. I have the trophy. Um, the, the, there's nothing wrong with counting ums and ahs but we should still be real and in the moment whenever we're on stage. We need to be present, not perfect. So it wasn't until the finals that I worked on ouch and the preparation process to condense it. Mark Brown, my coach said, the starting point of writing a new speech from scratch, which I had not done. I went through the first five levels and then the finals, you have to have a completely different speech. And Mark said, choose a child in your life. And having no children, I thought, well, my nephew, Michael, he was the closest one I had. And he said, if you were going to die tomorrow, what one lesson that you learned from your life would you want to pass on to Michael? And that forced me to go really deep. Like I, he said, Darren, take two or three days. This isn't just an answer you spit out. This is what matters to you. So I literally wrote out, I have four pages of messages and ideas and lessons that I learned. And some of them were cliche and there's nothing wrong with that. He said, just write them down. It was the bottom of the fourth page when I realized uh, I became a comedian because I was willing to fail. Because I was willing to make mistakes, that's how I became successful. And so I realized that was the working title of Ouch, my winning speech, was willing to fail. And then it evolved slowly into Ouch. And I gave that speech anywhere I could. An average Toastmaster maybe gives three or four prepared speeches in a year. Okay, an average day for me is I would go to a breakfast club, give the speech. I would leave, I would go to my day job. I would leave early for lunch, take an extended lunch, go to a lunchtime club, give the speech, and go back to my day job, work until the evening, and then at night I would go to a community club and give the speech and get feedback. So in an average day, I gave the speech three times in gut feedback. So if you look at what I did in a day compared to what an average Toastmaster does in a year, you know, I 
I'm not special. I just use the tool of Toastmasters better than most. So Toastmasters is just a tool. It's what you do with it. Now, I'm not saying you should give speech, three speeches a day, every day. I don't understand. I want you to give more speeches more often because the true growth comes from the feedback that you get. I love Toastmasters. The one mistake we make at Toastmasters is we teach people to write a new speech. So you give a speech, you get feedback, you write a new speech. You give a speech, you get feedback, you write a new speech. Well, it's not, not reality. There's no professional speaker in the world who gives a new speech every time. The true evolution of a speaker and a speech is to take the feedback and then incorporate it. So I gave, I had 77 days to work on that speech and I gave it as often as I could whenever a club would allow me to come and I gave it 22 times. Uh, so it really evolved and one of my new phrases is resolve to evolve. Not just you as a speaker but also an individual speech. Uh, I wrote a new keynote last year called Sponge that I'm gonna do at the Toastmasters International Convention this year. So if anyone can join us in Vegas this year for the International Convention, you'll see me as the opening speaker doing my new speech, Sponge. But when I worked on it, when I first gave that earlier this year, I went to every Toastmasters club who would let me practice it. And I recorded it as well. And I you know, got the feedback, recorded it. And if they would give me 10 minutes, I would do the opening 10 minutes of my speech. If they give me 20, I'd do 20 minutes. If they gave me five, I would do five. Maybe I just worked on the close. So you're constantly evolving it because you and I have a privilege of the platform. And the more preparation we do, the better we'll be. So a couple quick uh, questions uh, that I asked for feedback. I asked what inspired you? What made you think? Um, any comments, you know, other comments, and then, I can't think of the fourth question, but I know there's four. <laughs> but anyway, ask yourself specific questions. So if you're working on the opening, oh, was, was there anything that was confusing? Because most of the time when I'm coaching people, it's clarity, clarity, clarity. And a lot of times we think we're clear but the audience isn't clear. Just because it's clear in our head definitely doesn't mean it's clear in their head. So what can we make clearer? And every time I had the first version of my speech was like 1,492 words. And I had to condense it down. It's almost like Michelangelo. Here's the big block of clay and now we need to release the angel inside. So I would send a new version based on word count to my coach every day. I would celebrate when I could take three sentences and cut it down to two. When I could take a paragraph and cut it down to two sentences. It was that victory knowing, and here's my question that I would ask myself. I would say, how can I say it better in fewer words? How could I say it better in fewer words? So that way, it forced me to make the content richer. Knowing I had to get it down to around 750 words to get it into the time frame. So there's a lot to preparation and I hope that's been helpful, but just know that great speeches aren't written, they're rewritten. What have been some of your most challenging or perhaps even memorable speaking experiences? Hmm. There's always new challenges. Uh, sometimes it's room set up. A lot of times it's not having the audience's attention. One of my worst, most challenging ones uh, came from before the championship where uh, I was in a room and I was speaking at a professional conference and there was 300 people at the conference. But the meeting room I was speaking in only hold, held 200. And I asked the event planner, I said, like the math doesn't work, what's going on? And, and they said, oh, we had to have another meeting room down the hallway. So they took 100 out of the 300 and they put them in another room. I'm like, but they won't be able to see me. They said, that's okay. We're gonna pipe the, the sound down to the other room. They'll hear you. I'm like, what? And this was new in my career when I didn't have the confidence that I do now. And, but it's because of these challenges that we build our confidence. And as my comedy mentors taught me, I've learned more from the bad audiences than I ever have from the good audiences. 
And so in that situation, I was panicking and I'm trying to be positive. Lemons to lemonade, the lemons to lemon. How do I make this better? And I remember, uh, now this was an older crowd. They were um, seniors. And I remember that I was supposed to start about, let's say eight o'clock and it was getting to be nine o'clock and I haven't even gone up yet. And these people, seniors were older. So they're getting up and leaving. They don't care that there's a speaker, it's bedtime. So I'm like, how do I make this better? So I ran down to the other room and I was trying to get them to come and sit in the main room so at least they could see me because I'm very animated when I talk. So that's part of my delivery is seeing my expressions. So if they're only hearing it, they're losing out and it's not gonna be as fun or entertaining or inspiring. So I was in the other room and I could hear faintly in the background, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Darren LaCroix. I'm like, what? I wasn't even in the room. So I turned to run to the meeting room because they were introducing me and I knocked over an oxygen tank that was connected to a guy. I said they were older, they were seniors. I almost killed a man on my way to stage. And he was fine, but to me, it, it was this unbelievably challenging moment. I ran up on stage, I had no self-esteem, no confidence, and uh, I bombed miserably, it was horrible. And in my championship speech, I mentioned the second part of the story where I had a woman up on stage and my surefire bit always works. It's an improv game. And I asked, I said, she was standing very rigid and it's much funnier when the person is animated and she was standing there like a statue. And I begged her, I said, please do something with your hands. And she did. She covered my mouth. That's the part that's in the championship speech. And it was horrible and she got a laugh. And I just, I walked off stage and I said, I'm done. This is, and I called up my mentor, Rick Siegel. And I told him, I said, I bombed, I died, they hated me. And he said, so? Like, what do you mean so? But what he got me to realize is that every great speaker has bombed. And it's not a matter of if you'll bomb, it's when you'll bomb again. So because of challenging moments like that, I've, I've grown in my confidence and now I can handle challenges better. There'll always be some new challenge, the fire alarm going off, uh, people not showing up. I did one, there's a room just last year in Las Vegas here where there's 200 seats and there was like 12 people there and it's just a challenging situation. So I got off the pulpit, I came down and into the audience and I spoke right where they were sitting. So it was weird, it was awkward, but you and I as professionals, we need to make the best of every situation. It's not about us. Um, so that's one of my most challenging days. Can you name just maybe a few of the key uh, communication improvements that you made from the time you began Toastmasters to the time that you won your speech? And then could you also preface that with, uh, or end that with, uh, what, what significant improvements were made after uh, your winning speech to now where you are? So before, it was just a confidence thing. The more, you know, my mentor said, any day that you don't get on stage is a day that you don't grow. So I locked on like a pit bull to that habit. In fact, my license plate in Las Vegas says stage time. I never want to forget that habit because that's the habit that brought me here. The moment where I started working with my coach, Mark Brown, he started showing me the power of dialogue as opposed to narration. So I used to tell my stories in narration. I didn't know any better. And narration is what happened last week, last month, last year, telling us about that story. And then uh, Lou Heckler, a great speaker coach says, take us, don't tell us take us to the moment where we can hear the story, where we can hear the dialogue. And it's in a quick interview like this, it's a little challenging to explain everything to detail, but quite honestly, it's my storytelling. So before that, it was just getting on stage as often as I could. It was finding my stories, the stories that were powerful. Um, one of the past presidents of uh, NSA she had taught me, she said, Darren, the moments of your life where you had a revelation, where you had an aha, those stories are the ones that you need to tell to give us one of those ahas. 
So before it was finding the stories and delivering it in dialogue. Um, after I won the championship, I changed my modality where I was trying to become the best speaker. And now my goal, realizing that I love inspiring other people and helping other people, my new goal became becoming the greatest teacher of public speaking. That when people come to my workshops or join my Stage Time University, that they get a whole new perspective. And I've condensed down the important learning that I never got after seven years as a Toastmaster. So I would say after, when I changed my modality, it's really teaching the use of delivery and stage teaching my hologram concept and the use of stage. Most people use the stage without purpose. They move without purpose. They just think there's three places on the stage, left, right, and center, and then the whole goal is to just even it out. And that's not true. There should be a specific reason you're standing in each place and why you move. And again, goes back to all of my coaching is about clarity, clarity, clarity. Now, how would you say your communication skills have benefited you both professionally and personally over the years? I think for me, the biggest is being a better listener, being more attentive and hearing the intention behind somebody's conversation and being able to key in on that better. Not just hearing the words, but hearing the delivery, the intention, uh, meaning if someone says, hey, how's your day? Or somebody says, hey, how's your day? Or hey, how's your day? You know, there's different, different intention behind it. So I think it's got me more in tune to that, to be more present. And I think as a great communicator, it's being present. You know, texting is a huge challenge. People are trying to have a conversation with you or in your audience, texting. While, you know, you've got to bring people present and you gotta be present for the other person. So I think that's the biggest help help in my communication from going to Toastmasters and studying speaking and most importantly helping other emerging speakers. Well with that being said, what advice would you have for someone who is truly seeking to become a highly skilled communicator? I think most importantly take an improv class because being present is more important. So many people want to be perfect on stage and because they want to be perfect they're not present. If you look at early versions of my winning speech, you'll see I was in my head. I was thinking of what I was gonna say next. So if I'm thinking of what I'm gonna say next, I'm not connected to you. And I can only go back and forth between the two. I'm really not doing both at once. So be present, not perfect, definitely will take you eons ahead. And then telling your stories in dialogue versus narration. It's a lot easier to be more compelling and in your storytelling if you do it in dialogue. Well, thanks, Darren. And as we uh, kind of conclude our interview, just want to know, are there any additional insights that you can offer and share with us as speakers and communicators and professionals? What are the skills or tips or any techniques that, that you just, we all have to practice and walk away with? I think the biggest is realizing it's something that's mastered. There's an art to speaking. You don't just take a class once and do it. It's You've got to internalize content. You've got to get lessons and then go apply it. It's just like the riding a bike. You can't do it by reading a manual. Although reading the manual can help you get some new insights, but you still got to go ride the bike. And it's a constant process. I've been at this for two decades and I'm still learning. And I know sometimes people say that, but I mean it, I'm still learning on how to be a better speaker, how to take my stories and make them more insightful. And then my goal is to become the best at learning it so then I can go and teach it. But teaching it also makes me a better student. So realizing that no matter what you wanna master, becoming a better student will forever change you. If you're committed to being a student and you're never done, as soon as you think, I know it all. Oh, I've heard that before. You're done. If you've heard something great before, for example, Patricia Fripp, one of my mentors and one of the best speaker coaches in the country, uh, keynote speaker, key keynote coach, um, one of the keynotes at this year's Toastmasters convention as well. Uh, she has taught me so much. And sometimes she'll tell a story a second time and I see other people in the audience go, oh, she's gonna tell that story again? 
and I think, great, what a perfect opportunity. Now I get to see why she tells it. I get to study that story. When I studied the previous world champions, I studied 90 world-class speakers, okay? The, final, the semi-finalists for nine years, 10 contestants each year, 90 world-class speeches. And I watched the winners, uh, the nine contestants, each winner from each year, and I watched it over and over again. What was the difference between the person who came in first and the person who came in second. What was that tiny difference that made all the difference? And one of the biggest ones was the pause. A lot of us don't have the confidence to pause, but we have to pause not for effect. We have to pause to let our audiences reflect. Dale Carnegie said that speaking is a dialogue, not a monologue. We're actually having a conversation with the little voice in each audience member's head. So if we're having that conversation, we can't cut them off. We can't say something and then keep talking. We have to say something, let it land. Say something else, ask a you focus question, let it land. There's so much to this. If you wanna be the ultimate or world-class communicator, you've gotta be a perpetual student and be hungry to learn. So uh, if you want to get my weekly tips, you can go to um, top10speakingtips.com and get sign up for my free newsletter. Or you know, if you're really hungry, you really want to learn more, go to, go to stagetimeuniversity.com and see all the programs and courses I have to offer. And it's really, it's not for everybody, it's for the serious people. So check that out and join us. And uh, thanks and congratulations to everybody in Chile. Uh, really get behind this and make Toastmasters one of the premier organizations in your country uh, to really help people. And my last tip is don't write a speech. Help people from your experience. You have a story to tell and someone needs to hear it.